Let's talk about holosystolic murmurs, um, mitral regurgitation being the most common of the holosystolic murmurs. Um, this happens all the way from the beginning of systole through the end of systole. And why does that happen? Well, because the mitral and tricuspid valves close as soon as ventricular contraction occurs. As soon as the ventricle begins to contract, the pressure in the ventricle is higher than the pressure in the in the atria, and it closes the aortic or the um, AV valve, the either mitral or tricuspid valve. Okay, that means that you probably won't hear the first heart sound. Right? Think about it this way: mitral regurgitation. This is a uh, systolic murmur that's holo, uh, holosystolic or pansystolic happens all the way through systole. If the thing that causes the first heart sound is closure of the mitral valve and you have leaking of the mitral valve, that means it's not closing, then you're not going to hear the first heart sound, right? Makes sense. Well, the other reason is that the the murmur begins as soon as that valve ostensibly closes, right? As soon as ventricular contraction happens, that blood starts moving backwards. All right. A VSD, also it's harsh, heard throughout systole, uh, often associated with a thrill particularly the smaller VSDs. The smaller the VSD, think about it, if you have your finger over a garden hose, you turn the garden hose on, um, that jet squirts out really far. That's very turbulent. It's going to make a louder sound than if you just don't have your thumb over it. So giant VSDs don't usually make a lot of noise and don't often have a thrill associated with them. But, you know, that's sort of general guidance. That's not a hard, fast rule. Now we see flow murmurs too. So innocent murmurs are they, they just sound innocent. They're not they're not pathologic. They're not late peaking by any means. You always hear the second heart sound very well. And the flow really happens very quickly after S1. It goes uh, louder and then it gets softer. But aortic stenosis we listen and we see this, um, we, we hear the first heart sound very clearly, even at the aortic site. And then we hear this ejection sound, although you probably won't hear it. And then we hear the crescendo, decrescendo murmur. The louder the murmur is and the more harsh um, does not mean the more severe the stenosis, okay? What means the most severe stenosis is how late this peaks. If it peaks so late that it overtakes the second heart sound or the A2 component of the second heart sound, then that's severe aortic stenosis, right? We judge the severity of aortic stenosis by how by what we hear in systole. And if this systolic murmur takes so long to happen that it peaks out here and then overtakes the second heart sound, that's really bad aortic stenosis. Makes sense, right? All right. One little trick to differentiate this murmur from this murmur is to listen for an extra beat. So the beat following a premature beat not the premature beat, but the one after it. If you have aortic stenosis, it's going to sound louder. That beat after the premature beat will be louder in aortic stenosis than in mitral regurgitation. So here's the way it'll sound. If you have aortic stenosis with a premature beat, it'll sound like this. Lub stub, lub stub, lub stub, lub stub, lub stub, lub stub, lub stub. Right? So it's lub stub, lub stub, lub stub, lub stub. Why does that happen? The beat after the premature beat, well, the premature beat doesn't have much blood in it because it's early. It didn't have enough time to fill the ventricle. So the amount of blood it's squirting out is very little. But the beat after that 
is there's a compensatory pause, right? So the beat after the premature beat has lots of time for ventricular filling. And now when it contracts, the volume is going to be a much greater volume of blood and it makes a louder sound. Here's what you hear with a premature beat in mitral regurgitation. Exactly the same. Exactly the same. No change in intensity.